other uh, example where logarithms is used a lot in biology is in graphing. Uh, as I said in the introduction, that things like microbial growth follow a logarithmic pattern because of the fact that they grow in an exponential way. If we graph this, if we went time on the x-axis and number of bacterial cells on this axis, what this graph would look like would be something like this. And this is hard for scientists to be able to extrapolate data from. Most scientists like to work with a linear relationship between time and the dependent variable here, which is our bacterial cells. So how most microbiologists graph this information is to graph, again, time on this axis, but log of the number of bacterial cells on this axis. And by taking the logarithm of the numbers of cells here, we generate a linear graph here from the same data. So we often use logarithms to transform experimental data into something which we can graphically use and interpret in a more simple and meaningful way. The other example which, uh, which logarithms uh, are used a lot in is things like working out the migration rate of molecules such as, DN such as DNA in agarose gel electrophoresis. Um, some of you may have seen on television these gels which have these like barcode fluorescent bands on them that represent DNA molecules. The longer DNA molecules find it harder to enter into the gel when they are placed in an electric field, where the smaller ones move more quickly through the gel and migrate further. The distance in which these molecules will migrate into the gel is inversely proportional to the log of the number of base pairs in the DNA molecule. The DNA molecules are made up of lots and lots of base pairs. If you take the log of how many base pairs are in that DNA molecule, you will find that it will, um, you will be able to predict how far it will move into a gel relative to a smaller DNA molecule. So there's some examples where logarithms are used in biology. Graphing is a very important skill in, um, in science. And often we think about the data that we have in terms of being a dependent variable and an independent variable. The independent variable is a thing that you actually have control of in the experiment. For instance, in the example up here, where we are looking at what the absorbance of a particular concentration of protein is in a spectrophotometer, us as the experimental scientists has chosen these values so they become our, our independent variable. The dependent variable is a thing that changes as a consequence of what we decide upon. So this is our dependent variable, which of course is going to change depending upon our protein concentration. So when you're looking at your experimental data, it's important for you to distinguish between those two particular um, aspects of the experiment. The thing that you decide upon and the thing that you measure. Because when we go to uh, plot out our data in any type of graph, what we do is we put our independent variable on the x-axis and our dependent variable on the y-axis. So in our experiment here, our independent variable, which is our protein concentration, goes on the x-axis, where our experimental data goes on the y-axis here. And I often see lots of students mixing up which axis to plot which of the data on. So make sure that's the first thing that you think about when you're trying to present your particular data. 
The second question that you have to ask yourself is what type of graph are you going to uh, represent your data with? You often see data presented in things like column graphs or something like this, which we call a line graph. Again, as a scientist, there are situations where you use a column graph and there's situations where you use a line graph. An example of where you would use a column graph, just simply, it may be that you are going to survey the um, sizes of seeds in, uh, in a range of different plants and you may have a um, canola seed, a poppy seed, um, and a sunflower seed. I know that a poppy seed is quite small. I'll put it down at one millimetre, we'll have five millimetres and we'll have So our choices are we could present this particular data as a line graph. So a canola seed I know are a bit bigger than a canola seed. I'll put them at about two millimetres in size. A poppy seed about here. And sunflower seeds are quite large, probably about eight here. Now it would be absolutely ridiculous to present this data as a line graph. Because if you think about it, a line graph is trying to give you information about data in between the different data points that you collect in the experiment. So what sort of information would be halfway through a canola seed and a poppy seed? What, a hybrid between a canola and a poppy seed plant? No, that's just ridiculous. The other thing to think about is that you know, okay, we've got data here, here and here. If I swapped and put the sunflower here, the canola seed here and the poppy seed here, we'd have a graph with a totally different type of shape to it. So these sorts of experiments where there is no actual link between the species here, we always present as a column graph. So our canola seed, as I said, is probably about two centimetres, uh, two millimetres, poppy seed about one, and our sunflower seed is quite, quite large here. So in these sorts of experiments, we would use a column graph. Another example is, is if you are doing a survey about whether or which football team that but children in different classrooms barrack for. You would use these sorts of types of graphs to display that, that particular data, those particular data sets. We use a line graph when we are trying to display or even get information about what is happening in between our data sets here. So I'll go through in in, a, in, uh, in quite a bit of detail how we draw a line graph using a data set looking something like this. Okay, so if we're presented with data like this where we have two lots of quantitative data, a common way in which we would present it would be in a line graph. Now a lot of students have been doing line graphs all through their high school studies and into their university studies. However, there's quite a lot of convention that biologists use when constructing a graph. So in our example here, we have biology type data where we have varied the protein concentration of a solution and we usually put a dye in with it and then we stick it in a spectrophotometer that reads basically the intensity of the colour which is produced. From these sorts of data, we can have an unknown reading from our spectrophotometer and estimate how much particular protein is present in that sample. To do this, the first thing we do is construct what is known as a standard curve. Oh. So 
So our standard curve has an X and Y axis. As we talked about before, our independent variable is this here, our protein concentration, which we varied as uh, in our experimental design. When we look at the experimental data, we see that the increments here are not even. So when we think about setting up our independent variable on our x-axis here, we have to look at the dynamic range of the start of our protein concentration, which is 1 or 0, down to 25. So we will put 25 being the maximum on our x-axis here, 0 here, and I'm going to divide it evenly into increments between 0 and 25. See how I go here. 5, 10, 15, 20. Okay? We do not make the increments exactly what is here, which I've seen students do in lots of occasions, where we would have 1 and then an equal distance 5, then another equal distance 10, and then 20, and then 25. You have to make the increments even along the dynamic scale of your x-axis. The axis also needs a label, in this case protein and square brackets in biology means concentration. Concentration in protein and we need units and in this case it's micrograms per mil in brackets there. So that's what we need for our x-axis. Y-axis is very, very similar. We look at the dynamic range, 0 to around 2. So I'll make my top reading here 2. And I'll try and do it evenly. 1.5. Our y-axis needs a label. In this case, is absorbance. Those of you who are doing biochemistry will know that absorbance doesn't actually have any units because it's actually a ratio. But what we do have to write on our y-axis is the wavelength in which the absorbance is measured. In this case, it's 555 nanometers, like that there. Our graph needs a title. And uh, that will depend upon the uh, experiment. In this case, it will be standard curve for determination of unknown protein concentrations. All right, then we go to plot our data. So one down here, down to point, uh, it's not quite one, so we put a nice clear data point. 5.3, about here. Obviously, you do this on graph paper, 10, about here, 20 out here is around 1.6, and this one's about, whoop, I think that's probably a bit high, 1.6, and this one's about 1.92. So the data points are really clear, and often in these sorts of experiments, you may even do duplicate readings and plot duplicate points. You then draw a line of best fit. I've got my trusty ruler here, I'll see how I go. Standard curves typically go through zero, zero, because the spectrophotometer whoop, is usually blanked on that. And you draw a line of best fit. The line of best fit, you want to go through, and mine could probably be a little bit higher, but you want it to try and go through the maximum number of points or have equal numbers of your data points laying above or below the line. A line of best fit is very important. It's not a line where we join up the dots because the line of best fit is also taking into account some of the experimental error in the experiment. So we have, by drawing a line of best fit, we know from the um, theory behind a standard curve that as long as you're in the linear part of the curve, there should be a, um, a, a relationship 
a linear relationship between the concentration of protein and the absorbance that we get in the experiment. So we should get a straight line. So this is our line of best fit and what this then allows us to do is to use, if our line of best fit is good enough, use information here between our data points. For example, after I've done this experiment and if at the same time I have measured an unknown protein concentration, and I'll just call it unknown one, and I'll say that it had an absorbance of 1.40. This unknown sample could be something like some liver that we have ground up and put in some buffer, and we want to know how much protein is present in that particular sample. So we would take some of that protein and carry out the same experiment and get an absorbance reading for our liver sample. We can then use our standard curve to estimate how much protein is present in that sample. So how we do this is that we go up our y-axis to 1.4, which is about there on our, on our y-axis. We draw a dotted line here, Oop. and we come down here. And you can see here that our liver sample would have something like 15 micrograms per mil of protein in there. Okay? So these sorts of graphs, what we're able to, use, to do is to juice information about what happens between data points and use that information experimentally. And this is a very, very common technique that we use in biology. So a couple of things to remember is that when you are constructing graphs, it's not just about getting the number right, it's also about presenting the graph in a conventional way so other scientists can critique the validity of your results by looking at the graph. So that's why it's very important to have all these aspects on your graph, including a title, your axis labels and clear experimental points.